Good evening, everyone. We'd like to start our dinner program. I'm Lisa Bartlett, president of the Association of California Cities, Orange County. We'd like to welcome all of you here this evening. We've got a wonderful program for you. Our topic this evening is metrics for fire service, which I'm sure we're all very much interested in. Before we begin, I'd like to thank the City of Cyprus for opening our program. Please welcome Mayor Prakash Narain and Mayor Pro Tem Leroy Mills, who will lead us in the pledge and the invocation. It is with the uh, greatest freedom in which each of us left our respective uh, cities and drove to this venue tonight. So would you please join with me in expressing our deepest reverence by citing the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States and remember the uh, numerous sacrifices that have been given to secure our freedom and our liberty. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing. God in heaven, we assemble here today to conduct the business of the Association of California Cities, Orange County. We express gratitude for your blessings, and we invite your wisdom and guidance upon our actions and deliberations. Please bless us with the spirit of goodwill, collegiality, and mutual respect as we consider the important matters before us today. Please help us to reach a collective concurrence that will be good for our community and consistent with thy will for us as a people and as a nation. We are mindful of the staff who assist us in this work, and we ask your blessing upon them as well. God bless us all, we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Due to the overwhelming amount of feedback from our January meeting on cybersecurity, ACCOC, in partnership with Parsons, would like to announce a cybersecurity assessment service. And to do so, I'd like to introduce ACCOC board member and Mission Bay Hill Council member Frank Yuri, who served as our panel moderator on this topic in January, to present some information to you about this assessment. Frank? Somebody said Frank who? Frank you. <laughs> Frank you very much. I've got a lot of bad jokes like that. It's, oh, it's, just go with the initials. It's bad enough, so we're fine. Uh, some people are thinking about that for the first time. Uh, I, I think many of us were here in the January meeting where we were talking about cybersecurity, and it's one of the benefits of ACCOC is not only do we bring topics that are very important to all of us together, but we do it a lot of times ahead of when most other agencies would be thinking about it. When we went through and had our cybersecurity discussion, the feedback was so incredible from all of our members saying, we, we've got to do more, we've got to do more. And I know you get a lot of handouts at your, at your desk or at your chair, pull out the one that says Parsons. What Parsons is doing, and this is a, you know, once again, one of those reasons why you join ACCOC. This is a member benefit, and what Parsons is offering is to do a complimentary vulnerability assessment for each member city of ACCOC. Now, I'm going to throw out that one stat real quickly that we talked about in January. In our city, for every three emails we get, we get four cybersecurity attacks of some form. So there are more attacks on our systems in Mission Viejo than there are emails that come through. So what Parsons has done in, con in conjunction with ACCOC, they're going to offer to anybody who takes it, and by the way, I'd like a listing of all the cities that don't take up for this, because uh, I've got some hackers I could send over their way. <coughs> but uh, they'll come in and they can do a couple of different, as different assessments. The first one is on what's called the applications, the programs that you run, and they'll also take a look at your network and your hardware infrastructure to make sure that's all in place. So uh, I, I really strongly recommend that you take this back to your city managers, take this back to your, uh, to your city IT directors if you, if you have them. Let them take a look at it, get in touch with either Mo or we got Chuck, wait, who was here, who scared the living daylights out of all of us in January. Uh, 
make sure you get in contact with them because th these are the important things that we do. Also to let you know that once the reports are, given, are, are completed, the reports will be given to each council so they can take a look at it. Those will be, of course, confidential reports unless you do not review, renew your ACCOC or dues, in which case we'll put them up there. So take a look at it. It's a, it's a wonderful program. Like I said, it's, a, it's one of those members only type things for ACCOC cities. It's one of the reasons why we join. And I'll tell you right now, we're going to be working on ours tomorrow. So thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Yuri. Many thanks for Parsons for the offer for the security assessment. I'd like to encourage all of you to take advantage of that great, unique opportunity. Chuck McGregor, Vice President of Parsons, will be here to answer any additional questions um, after the presentation. And at this time, I'd like all of you to welcome our wonderful CEO of ACCOC, Lacey Kelly. Thank you, Lisa. Welcome, everybody. I'm so glad you're all here. I know there was a lot of other events going on tonight, and we're so glad that you're here to uh, hear our rock star panel of specialists on this important topic. Before we get to that, I just want to do a couple of things. First of all, I want to acknowledge uh, prior senator and state transportation uh, commission chair, Marianne Bergeson. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Uh, the Senator is in our emeritus program, and so we have the benefit of her wisdom in several of our other programs as well. So thank you for coming tonight. And I think we have some other emeritus members here too. Do we have other emeritus members here? Okay, can you stand up? Thanks for coming tonight. <laughs> Nobody's standing up. Doug Daver, Jerry Monti, Alan Songstad, Joel Wattenschlager. Thanks for being here. I want to thank our sponsors, Care Ambulance, uh, Troy Hagen, Bob Berry, Bill Weston, and Rick Richardson. I think you all are here. Thank you very much for sponsoring tonight. <laughs> also, I have three more. I should have probably said to withhold applause, but Probalski Research, Justin Wallen, Synoptech, Susan Oberholzer, and Hillary Powers. Thank you very much. And Trepepe Smith, Ryder Smith, they are filming our program tonight. Thank you very much for doing that for us and the camera crew that came with you. Okay, so uh, a couple of things. We count on your feedback in order to bring you uh, programming. We don't just make this stuff up. We have you tell us what kind of programming you would like us to put together. Um, so we have a program evaluation on your seats. If you would please fill this out and give it to my staff or me at the end of the program, we'd appreciate that. For those of you that are members or affiliate members on the back, is a list of all our committees and upcoming events. If there's anything you would like to be a part of or volunteer for or a committee you'd like to be on, we'd love you to participate. We are the hub for good public policy from the ground up. We're collaborative and we'd like your participation. The other part of tonight's audience participation is the Q&A period and we want to try to get through this uh, very meaty program as timely as we can and facilitate questions as quickly as we can. So you have some note cards on your table and pens and if you will just write down your question, we're going to hold all of them to the end, write down your question, put your hand up like this and uh, during any time during the program our staff will come by and get that for you and we will hand them to our moderator. Um, also, just quickly, we have some upcoming events. We just voted in our new board of directors for 2013, and uh, the installation of that board of directors and our new president, the mayor of uh, Newport Beach, uh, the Honorable Keith Curry, will be installed at the new uh, City Hall for Newport Beach, which is gorgeous. We're going to get a sneak peek of it and have a reception there, so please all come. And that is on April 11th. We're also going to Sacramento on Monday and Tuesday, we have a great group and we will report back to you, but we expect good things to report when we get back. And on May 30th, we have our fourth annual city infrastructure conference, so please make note of that. And lastly, uh, one of the ways that we are able to make things inexpensive for our members is through sponsorships. And our reception and installation of our board is at no cost, and the way that we do that is with sponsorships. So. We're looking for a little more help. There's a flyer on your chair. You can get a hold of Gabriella Hill if you can help us support this uh, fun and very important event. And with that, we have one more tradition here at ACCOC, and I'm sure you can imagine with a facilitator and four panelists, reading all those bios would take probably till the end of the program because they're all so distinguished. So we give you a program, and we don't read our full bio, so please read this and get to know all of your wonderful speakers and facilitator tonight. And I'm just going to introduce and say just a couple things about our facilitator, Mr. Todd Priest, as you make your way up here. Our moderator this evening is Todd Priest. 
He is the Vice President at Kurt Pringle & Associates and has 20 years experience in government and public affairs. He has an extensive background working with regional governments and he says that's enough, and is, uh, has become a, quite an expert in the area of SB 375, one of our most sweeping land use bills um, in recent history. And I will leave it at that. You can read the rest in your program. And with that, will you help me welcome our moderator, Mr. Todd Priest. Great. Well, thank you. I appreciate uh, that, Lacey. When she asked me would I come and help moderate one of the panels for uh, the association, I said, sure, great. Give me something that's not controversial, something that uh, people will enjoy, have a couple glasses of wine, and be on their way. And uh, that's what we're going to make sure that uh, we give to you tonight. We want to make sure that you have the information as city leaders to make the best decisions in your communities. We know that every city in, in Orange County is not immune to the challenges of uh, the fiscal restraints that, that are put upon us. But we want to make sure that two things get taken care of, and, and primarily one of them is public safety. It's always the first priority of our local elected officials. And the second one is how do we best spend the money that uh, we are um, honored to be able to protect on behalf of the taxpayer. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. The discussion that we're going to have tonight, hopefully you'll walk away and we'll have learned something. We're not here to advocate that you do any particular um, program in your city, but we want you to be aware of what the possibilities are out there. So know that it's not uh, Lacey's or the association's desire that any of these programs that are discussed tonight go back into your city. It's more of an education that hopefully you walk away and go, gosh, I didn't know that before. It helps me, you know, when I start to look at those type of, of issues as an elected official, at least I'll have a little bit of uh, background. So with that, as Lacey said, we're going to keep uh, the introductions very brief because you have those, but I want to bring up our panelists uh, this evening. We have Alan Long, who's not only with uh, the fire department in Anaheim, but he's also an elected official in Murrieta. So he wears both of those hats. How does he worry about public safety in Anaheim, but also how does he worry about uh, financial stability in, in the city that he's been elected to? We also are fortunate enough, and make sure I get these in order, to have Mike Metro, who's the Deputy Fire Chief for Los Angeles County Fire Department. So we're going to try to bring you a variety of voices tonight. So we'll have local voices, we'll have some smaller area cities. Now we've got somebody from the county. I also want to invite uh, Mike Dury from the city of Long Beach, who's the fire chief. And it'll be interesting when we uh, introduce him for his, his portion. And last but not least is Ronnie Coleman, who's the former state fire marshal for the state of California. So we're fortunate to have a variety of, of folks that deal in public safety speak to you tonight. So you didn't come here to speak to me or to hear from me, so you wanted to hear from these gentlemen. So first we'll have Alan Long, as I mentioned, is a council member in the city of Murrieta and is a battalion chief with the department, uh, the fire department in Anaheim. He focuses in on emergency management, preparedness, and uh, drug enforcement, and a whole lot of things in your brochure that I'm not going to read. So Alan, please. Thank you, Todd, and uh, I just want to thank the ACC for having me here uh, this evening and to thank them from, for putting together such an impressive panel. I, I do have to say I'm glad I'm going first because we got some heavy hitters here that I would not want to follow. Um, thank you to the Anaheim firefighters that showed up uh, in support. We appreciate you coming tonight. And lastly, uh, I want to thank my wife who drove out from Marietta uh, with the multiple hats that I wear. If she doesn't come to these types of things, she doesn't get to see me. So uh, thank you for coming out. Um, and, and that's really true. Uh, I do have uh, a background uh, as an elected official and the fire service, um, but I couldn't do all of these things if I didn't have an extraordinary partner at home. And to better tell you a little bit more about my wife, I'm going to tell you a story that happened. Uh, we, we were coming back from a date night. And it was midnight, and we stopped at a gas station to get fuel and a drink. And I couldn't help but to notice that my wife was talking to the night manager. And I was curious as to know why she was talking to the night manager. So when we got into the car, I asked her. And uh, she said, oh, well, uh, I used to date him in high school. <laughs> and uh, now my pride, I was feeling pretty good about myself at the time because I just got elected. I just made uh, battalion chief. So I was feeling pretty good about myself. And what I said was completely out of line. So I apologize ahead of time if I offend anyone. 
I said to her, I said, oh, well, if you would have married him, you would have been married to the night manager of the gas station store. And she, she looked at me and gave me the look, and some of you know the look, and she said, oh, not really. If I would have married him, he would have been an elected official and a battalion chief. <laughs> so, very true story. It's my better half, Lisa. So, thank you. If I keep embarrassing her like that, she's gonna stop coming, so I gotta watch myself, so. A uh, little bit more about my background. I think that's important to, so you understand my perspective on the fire service. Uh, the city that I'm elected in is a town of 105,000. Uh, when I moved there, it was 2,000. So I, I, I saw a tremendous amount of growth. Today, Marietta uh, has an average age of 32. The mean income level is 100,000. And 34% of our population have four-year college degrees. We do have a problem. 66% of our community commutes out of town for work, and we're working on that. We're putting in a lot of infrastructure. So I grew up in the town, saw the tremendous amount of growth. Uh, I got involved. I was active through high school uh, as a volunteer firefighter. And as soon as I got out of high school, uh, my wife and I were married and I was involved in the youth group. She was full-time in the ministry with Student Venture, visiting high school campuses for youth. Um, I ended up being the high school or youth pastor at my local church, so I thought maybe I was being pulled in a different direction. I'm a man of faith, and I always leave uh, an open door if, if the big G's telling me to go a different direction. But I knew I wanted to help people. And I didn't end up being a youth pastor. I went towards the direction of the fire service, and I was fortunate enough to get hired. But my involvement in the community uh, maintained. I still was active. I eventually became a planning commissioner. I was on the Public Safety and Traffic Commission. And then I got elected to the city council. Now, when I entered the city council, the fire department did not have a fire chief for the past nine months. Their highest ranking official was the field battalion chiefs. The administrative staff consisted of a senior secretary and a prevention officer. So needless to say, they needed some work. My colleagues kept turning to me, knowing my background, and were asking, how do things work? Why do you need that? They started talking about response times. They started talking about fractal measurements. Why do you do average? Very, very detailed questions. And I didn't have the data to give them. I had to explain to them everything, and I wished I would have had empirical data to support my decision. Well, along the way, we were able to get that data and make good decisions. And today, I'm proud to say, in August of 2012, the city of Marietta ranked the seventh safest city in the nation for cities with over 100,000 people to 250. They're fourth in California, number one in Riverside. And we did that on a very, very frugal budget, making wise decisions. So that's my background on the elected side. On the fire side, when I was going through college, I was hired with the Forest Service. I served as a hotshot on the El Carrizo hand crew with the crew of 18 members. I worked with CAL FIRE, assigned to the helicopter, command center, multiple areas of Riverside County with under contract and rural areas. I've worked on engine crews of one, two, three, and four. So I have the experience of knowing which one of those units uh, how, and how to respond on them. So, that brings me to what we're going to talk about today. That's a little bit of the background. And in, those, in the last two decades, decades, I have to say the demands of today are much different than they were when I started. And I think we're going to see a dramatic, dramatic change in the fire service in the ne next decade. So the decisions we make today, we have to keep the future in mind. And then I'm going to talk about the metrics and analytics and Anaheim's journey through the standards of cover and the strategic plan. And I know I have 15 minutes, so I'm going to blaze through this from a 30,000 foot level. Uh, I can go into the weeds and get much, much more detailed um, from the, the few slides that I'll show you, and my card will be available so I can talk to you afterwards if you'd like. So the first thing I want to say is that when you talk about metrics, standards, and benchmarks, Every single city is different. The demands are different. What drives the volume of calls is different in each city. It depends on your socioeconomics, 
your demographics, education, zoning density, construction era, when those buildings were built, all of those things are different. So when we look at the standards and metrics, they may be weighed differently in each of your communities, and that's for your experts to decide how much to weigh them, and you're going to hear about some of those standards and benchmarks. You may use some of them, none of them, or all of them. It really depends on your experts that you hired in your city. But we all have one thing in common, and the thing we, we have in common is we all need to ask ourselves, does fire department accurately describe what we do today? And I'll tell you, I couldn't think of a title that was more inaccurate for what we do today. We do a myriad of responsibilities, and the fire service hasn't really done a good job of educating the public on what we do day to day. So there are statistics that will say fires are down nationally, and that's true. And what you should be doing is, is taking that and measure if they're down in your jurisdiction, because they may very well meet, may be up but they're diluted than the national average. The fact is, call volumes are up. And if we're going to compare fires nationally, let's compare disasters. Disasters are larger and more frequent nationally and worldwide. The population is aging, and that's going to have a dramatic effect on our future of services and levels of services that we provide. So over the last two decades, what do we, what do we go to? We go to earthquakes, floods, terrorism, we go to chemical and biological responses. Our emergency medical services are transforming as we speak to something called community paramedicine. We have community resiliency. I learned today that for every dollar we spend on preparing our community, it saves $7 in a response. You want to talk about a return on investment, that is a great area for the fire service to, to invest in so that their community is well prepared. I talked about the aging population. I'm going to stop at health care reform for just a moment because I want to stress something about health care reform. Out of everything that has impacted the fire service, I believe this will have the greatest impact of all time. And the reason is there's a lot of money attached to it. Congress has figured out a way to save hundreds and billions of dollars by getting the right patient, the right type of care, and the fire service is strategically located throughout the nation to deliver that service the best. Now, you want to talk about getting me excited? I'm an elected official. I told you a little bit about my background, but what, something I didn't tell you is I'm a taxpayer before anything else. And if I can save our taxpayers hundreds and billions of dollars by getting the right care by the right level of service, that gets me excited, all with cost recovery involved. We're finally going to have something in place that will reimburse the taxpayers for the services they already provide. What I mean by that is right now we have a system where the only incentive to get reimbursed for a medical aid is one way, transport them to the hospital. That's it. It's the only way you're going to get reimbursed. Seventy percent of our medical aids don't need an emergency room. But that's where we take them. And the insurance companies, Medi-Cal, Medicare, pay tens of thousands of dollars for services that they didn't really need. What if we were able to go out and bandage up a, a bruise, tell them they need to see their doctor, send them to the urgent care, saving hundreds and millions of dollars? We get cost recovery, and the taxpayers save a lot of money. That really gets me excited, and I think that's the direction this is going. It's still in its infancy, but it's headed that direction. So all of these demands, all the expectations from the community, and at the same time, our budgets are decreasing. So you really have to self-examine yourself and say, are, are we, with all this change, have we changed to meet the demand? And if you look at where your fire stations are located, I, I don't know that that could be true. I think they're located and deployed. The concentration, distribution, and reliability are based on old methods. And I think our communities have changed. So what we did in Anaheim is we wiped the slate clean. We started going down the path of these four items. We started off with the standards of cover, the third one down, and a strategic plan that paralleled each other. These, this is what we asked ourselves. Who, what, why, when, where, 
how often, I talked about those responsibilities and expectations you have to ask, how often do they reasonably happen? And then the most important question in today's economy, how much? How much does it cost to do business the way we do it today? And how much is it going to cost to do business this way tomorrow? So the strategic plan and the standards of cover were two areas we started to go down. And, and part of the standards of cover is a risk analysis, which, which takes a microscope to your community to identify your hazards. And at the same time, we, we started to go through the accreditation process. And what the accreditation process is, is a third party panel of experts that come to your agency and verify and validate what you did. Whatever metrics, whatever analytics, whatever data you provided in the risk analysis, strategic plan, and standards of cover, they're going to validate that say, Anaheim is accredited. What they say they do, they do. What they say they need, they need. And their data has been verified. So there's no manipulation of the data. So the risk analysis, out of all those questions we ask, basically goes through the who, what, why, and can we prevent it from happening? Really, in the public safety service, that should be our ultimate goal. We shouldn't just be response-based. If we identify a hazard, we need to ask ourselves, can we reduce that hazard? Can we prevent them from calling 911? Can we reduce the demand? That should be the ultimate goal. So we took a microscopic view of, of what we protect. Uh, we considered the socioeconomics, demographics, concession types and era, et cetera, et cetera. I can go on and on on this topic alone for a full day. Here's a couple of the maps we, uh, we have. We took the, the city's median age. We wanted to know where is our city aging because we know the data indicates once you reach a certain age, you're more likely to call 911. You're more likely to have a medical condition in need of emergency medical services. We took land use and density into consideration. We took building size, type, and height. I didn't put it in here for the sake of time. We also mapped out where every structure over three stories were. And then we uh, took that and applied it to our strategic plan and our standards of cover, these two documents. Our strate strategic plan went out to the community and we asked them, what do you expect from your fire department? And we went to the council with recommendations. We researched the standards and benchmarks that existed today and other agencies were using. And we looked at those and we tried to combine them to balance out our resources and our deployment. One of the most common things that came back to us from the public was they wanted us there fast when they called 911, okay? They wanted us to tell them what they were doing what we were doing, explain things to them, and they wanted us to be professional. A common remark was, we want you to be nice. When we call 911, it's our emergency, we want you to treat us with respect. So when we did our research, we found in our standards and benchmarks, time was a key factor. The first unit response had the greatest impact of anything else. So that was a standard that we, we put into our strategic plan. And of course, everything had a cost and everything needed to be listed. So this was real refreshing to me. These are some of the key metrics. What I will point out, um, I won't go through all of these. Oops. The only thing that really ha dictated or mandated us in our staffing levels was the law. Uh, what's commonly known as two in and two out. Where, however you deploy, when you show up to a fire, you must have two outside before you can send two inside. So you had to consider that. The second thing we considered as far as uh, staffing is, what is the minimum amount of firefighters it's going to take to mitigate a basic single family dwelling bedroom fire? And that measurement is here at 15 firefighters and add a battalion chief, and that takes 16. So time and what we refer to as an effective uh, response force were the factors we considered when deploying our resources. So again, the science behind time, it's common sense to some, but the more time a fire burns, the larger it gets, the more disaster it becomes. The faster you get there, the, the less the fire has time to expand. American Heart Association's uh, science research on defibrillation, 
the survival rate decreases the more time it takes you to get there. This was interesting. Since time was a factor, we broke down the cascading of events. We tried, the, cus the, the fire service traditionally has measured response time and averages, and they only measure the time it takes to get from the fire station to the location, which makes sense because we want to measure if we're properly deployed, if we put fire stations in the right locations. But really what the customer is interested in, the customer is interested in how long does it take you from the time I call 911? And there are a lot of factors between the time they call 911 and the time we get there. For example, you have the uh, initiation of 911. You have the primary PSAP who answers it, determines if it's fire or if it's law enforcement and transfers the call. You have call taking time, alarm processing time, turnout time, when the alarm goes off in the station, how long does it take them to get to the fire engine and roll? Travel time, time from the fire station to on scene, and then what's not on here we added later is patient contact time. Because just because it takes us five minutes to get to the location, it takes us several minutes to get up to the 15th story of a hotel. And that's really what matters to the fire service. Averages are just that. They are a mathematical formula and it is not an accurate way to measure performance. Your fractal measurements are a much more accurate way to measure performance and it still has inherent issues but it's much better than average response times. When we measured our baseline, we found that we really weren't as good as we thought because we kept here an average response times of four minutes. If you took the fractal measurement time of total response time, yeah, our travel time was really good, but the total response time was really poor. We were not getting there in, in our benchmark stated objective. These are other uh, benchmarks. This is for fire, EMS, hazardous materials, and urban search and rescue. What we establish is we would like a first arriving unit to be there in less than four minutes, 59 seconds, 90% of the time. And it's like that for a first unit across the board since time was such a, a key factor. And then the remaining effective response force was eight minutes and 59 seconds, 90% of the time. Now we know in the city of Anaheim because of our geographic location and our boundaries, it's very difficult to do that, but that's what we shoot for and that's what we're gonna try to deploy um, our resources to accomplish. <clears throat> so the standards of cover is a, a much more detailed um, evaluation of where our resources are and what it boiled down to, and there's a lot more to it than this, but it really um, boiled down to concentration and distribution of resources. And remember when I mentioned how many responsibilities and added expectations in the last two decades? The why and the probability of that happening is really what is plugged in here. And I'm gonna go through these slides really fast because I just simply don't have time to explain every single one. But we have the community risk, so the potential loss. What we try to do in our SOC is paint a picture for anyone who reads it that it takes the biased opinions out. We're gonna give you an expert opinion as, as fire chiefs and as, as your officials, but we wanted to show you a picture if you do X this will happen. If you don't do X, this will happen. Here's the likelihood of an emergency happening in that area, and here's the cost associated with both. So you can make an educated decision. The probability consequence box, same type of uh, tool. And then we evaluated all of our calls. We, I spent months doing this. Th I'm gonna show you three slides. These are all calls combined in the entire city. We also did every single station and we did every single unit. And what this shows here, the colors for three years, 2009 for, to, through 2011, show the number of calls by time of day, day of the week, and hour of the day. So you can see all calls total, uh, the lighter the color, the least amount of calls, the darker the color, the more. So from about nine to nine, we had a peak. And again, we didn't want one station to be diluted with the other, so we looked at every single unit. So here are all of our fires, and the same thing from about nine to nine, and I'll tell you, intuitively, this is the one that surprised me, intuitively, if you would have asked me before I drilled down in the data, when do most fires occur, I would have told you at night. 
and the data didn't indicate that. The data indicated that most fires happen, again, between 9 and 9. These are our medical aids, again, hour of the day, day of the week, and all other calls, same thing. So that's just a, an example of some of the data we looked at. We also looked at all of our fires, and we also compared these to dollar loss. Was there any trends involved? Uh, were our fires happening in a certain location? We did this for multiple years. What we found out, even though it indicates that uh, most fires seem to be on the west side of Anaheim, our per capita ratio, it's pretty evenly out. Um, and there's a direct correlation with the more dense and the more people you have in an area, the more fires you're going to have. And we did this for all type of calls. So these are, uh, I'm going to speed it up a little bit. This is our concentration and, and distribution. These stations right here are what Anaheim currently has. And what the colors indicate are the white areas are where we know, based on modeling and historical response data, we cannot meet our four minute, 59 second benchmark travel time. The darker the blue, the more units we have that can meet that area. So this area in here, the real dark blue, we have more than three units that can get to that location in 459. So on this area, we have a high concentration of resources, but a poor distribution of those resources in this area. So we had to make some decisions. We ran over 100 models, I think it was, and the models uh, all had improvement. And we utilized our existing resources and redeployed them. We wiped the site clean and we said, if you could put your fire stations anywhere you wanted, where would you put them? And did that change response times? We, we built uh, fire departments with money was no option to see if that what better response times than it did. But surprisingly, some of the ones that didn't cost a lot had significant improvements. And so we tried to do what was economically viable. Now remember, when I started this process, um, we were in the worst economic climate we've ever seen. Uh, we put two, two units out of service and we were down 24 suppression personnel. We had a hiring freeze. So uh, my objectives were clear as to get better with what you had. Um, so what we did is we took, um, we also included technology to get better, and I'll explain that in just a minute. So the red areas, again, are the areas that we were not making our four minute, 59 second response time. So when we took a unit and we added it out to the right of the screen, our east side, you see a lot of that red went away. And that was an existing unit that we had, we made it a medic unit and we moved it out to that location and it took a lot of the red away. The second thing was to add technology and we, we added, uh, we wanted to see what vehicle preemption would do if we had the technology to turn all of our stop lights green so the fire engine didn't have to slow down at each stop light, would that improve response times and the results were tremendous. So you see just with technology, how much red went away. Phase two was to move two of our other doubled up units to different locations and we moved a couple fire stations. We wanted to see what that would do. Phase two, just about eliminated all the red. And then in phase two, we added the uh, vehicle preemption. And after phase two with the signal preemption, we just about eliminated all the red. Now, I will say this, the area that continued to say red over here, we have, uh, we're, we're, we have topography challenges over there. We have a lot of open space. We have a lot of hilly terrain up and down. It would be extremely expensive to get rid of the red in that area because you need a station on top of every mountaintop. And so we, we're gonna have to deal with that. Uh, so the conclusion, and I've been flagged a few times, the conclusion that we came to is we did have, uh, we altered our operations to meet demands. What I didn't mention is when we were going through this process and we started to drill down our cascading of events from the 911 call, would it, if we were able to make uh, paramedics out of truck companies add res untraditional responsibilities to them, we saved about a minute 
and call taking time. And when we measure things in seconds, a minute is extraordinary. Uh, so we were able to alter our operations and assign untraditional duties to, to others. We were able to save precious time. Uh, we did come up with some alternative uh, deployment models using the staffing we had of today. And then uh, we increased distribution with current staffing and overall improved service response times. And I think one of the most uh, significant impacts it has, that we finally have qualitative and quantitative uh, empirical data that we can continue to measure our, um, our fire department with to make sure we can improve on what we've done already. I know that was really fast. Again, I'll leave my card. You can, you can flag me down afterwards, and I'll be more than happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Alan. You know, as, as an advocate or a lobbyist, I, I learned quickly that the second most important thing you can do is give accurate data. And I think Alan did that. But I learned more quickly what the first important thing as an advocate you should do. And I just wanted to say, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, uh, Gail Eastman, your jacket is beautiful this evening. <laughs> <laughs> so our next speaker, back of the room's a little slow. There we go. Our next speaker comes from, oh, he's not next. Our next speaker comes from Long Beach. How do you like that? <laughs> so let me introduce the, the fire chief from the city of Long Beach. And what's uh, interesting about uh, Chief Dupree is his family has quite a history in Long Beach. Five generations were employed by the city, not in the city, but employed by the city. And four were actually in the fire uh, service of, of the city. So please welcome the chief from Long Beach. <laughs> Thank you very much. I want to thank the ACC for uh, inviting us here tonight. This is a great opportunity for me, and I, I sincerely thank, uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, while I'm waiting for that to come up, I will tell you a little bit about me. I am, as was mentioned, a fifth generation City of Long Beach employee, um, fourth generation firefighter. In fact, I'm, I'm a second generation fire chief in Long Beach. So my, um, I, I see Pat back there. We talked about this during my test. I, I want to thank the chief from Huntington Beach for being here. He was on my panel, so I, I <laughs> he, yeah, you're, whatever you need. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, my great great grandfather ran the Parks and Rec Department, um, who started the lifeguard program in Long Beach, and my great grandfather was the fire chief in Long Beach after the big earthquake in 1933. He served in that position for 13 years. My grandfather retired in 1976 as a battalion chief, and then my dad retired in 2000 as a deputy chief. So I mentioned to these guys at dinner, I had no choice whatsoever. This was, this was in the blood. So um, I've been the fire chief only for a short period of time. Uh, I was appointed in July, so I'm, I'm still relatively new in my position. But um, as things you'll see, we've kind of hit the ground running, uh, in part due to what Alan mentioned with the, with the economy. Over the past six to 10 years, it's been um, a completely different ball game. So we had to come in with a fresh set of eyes and open our minds and think about things differently. And before I get too far into it, one of my deputy chiefs is here, and I would be remiss if I didn't say that um, I am blessed, I am completely blessed in Long Beach with having, I think, the very best command staff in the fire service in this state. These, these people are, are creative, smart, innovative thinkers that um, we, we've, set, we've set forward. I, well, I'm sorry, Mike. I, 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 uh, uh, yeah. But he's here, and, you know, so. <laughs> so, but um, I, I am really blessed with a very creative group of people who are innovative in their thought process, and we embrace that innovation. And as we move forward and embrace our new reality, I think that level of thinking in municipal government is refreshing. So with that, I'll get into what I'm going to talk about. And I'm going to talk about uh, tonight is EMS. And the first thing I want to say to everybody is I am in no way whatsoever advocating that you consider doing this in your own city. I'm not advocating that this is the end all be all for pre-hospital emergency care. And I'm not advocating that what I'm suggesting, uh, what we're going to do in Long Beach is the right thing to do for your, your municipality or county. Every city has its own needs, and some things may fit well in Long Beach, they may not fit well in some other places. So as I mentioned, shrinking budgets do call for creative thinking. I mean, the, the reality is, as the budget diminishes, our mission doesn't change. We're still tasked with providing the same or better levels of care, regardless of what the budget says we have with regard to resources. So it does call for creative thinking. And in Long Beach, the compounding effect of reductions, over the last six years, we've removed four engine companies, 
a truck company and a rescue ambulance, yet we're still seeing an increase in call volume each and every single year. So the ability to manage the calls that continue to increase year in, year out, with the resources we have left, was a challenge for us. We needed to be able to handle most calls with the first arriving unit on the scene. And that kind of goes to what Alan Long was talking about, the ability to have an adequately staffed apparatus show up. The first arriving unit provides the biggest impact to pre-hospital emergency care, or fire suppression, or anything we do in the fire service. So as we, as we got into our budget preparation, as we started to think creatively, we needed to actually take a hard look at every facet of our organization. You know, for years in municipal government, and specifically in public safety, um, we were kind of the sacred cow, quite honestly. Uh, most municipal governments, even when things were borderline good, not so good, usually spared public safety to some extent, or it was the last place people would look. But we needed to take a look at every single facet in our organization to, che to achieve our budget savings and achieve our goals financially so that we could continue to provide that level of service that I talked about. So as I mentioned earlier, our mission has changed, but we must embrace the new methods um, that are out there to accomplish that mission. So our, our mission has not changed, actually. I'm sorry, I needed to rephrase that. So next slide. Whoop. So in Long Beach, we're going to talk about pre-hospital emergency care, paramedics. In Long Beach, we've been involved in pre-hospital emergency care with paramedics since 1972. Um, the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors established pre-hospital emergency care paramedic program in 1968 and at the time they established this they said because it had never been done in the county of Los Angeles prior to that that they wanted to have two fully functioning firefighter paramedics or paramedics on board an ambulance to deliver that that care to the public it had never been done prior to 1968 so Long Beach jumped on board this uh, program in 1972 and I'm happy to report that our existing system as it is now is much much better than we ever envisioned it would be in 1972 of course I was four years old so I don't know exactly uh, what it was like in 72 but over the last 45 years of pre-hospital emergency care in the county of Los Angeles there has never been a study done as to the effectiveness of deploying two firefighter paramedics or two paramedics on an ambulance to ride to the scene together. There's never been a study done in Los Angeles County that suggests, or anywhere for that matter, that suggests that sending two paramedics to the scene on the same ambulance provides for better patient care than if they got there uh, on different apparatus. So that's the core of the question. And this is something, as I mentioned, my command staff, um, very creative thinkers. This idea, I'll give credit where credit is due, my predecessor, um, Fire Chief Alan Padalano, actually put this out there as a topic of discussion a couple years ago, but it was kind of tabled. Um, because we went different directions with our budget. But we went back to this question and asked, we thought we needed to be serious and ask this question because it's a good one. Does paramedic service get better because the paramedics drive to the scene together on the same apparatus? Or does it matter how they get to the scene as long as there's still two at the scene? So we embraced it from that standpoint. So in Long Beach, over 85% of our calls are for pre-hospital emergency care. And one of the things that Alan's presentation said is, is fire, a fire department an accurate description of what we do? Uh, I think that's a very good question. I, I often refer to the fire service of today as an EMS service provider agency that's cross-trained in fighting fire and doing other stuff. <laughs> this is what we do. So uh, that was an important uh, considering factor as we had these discussions as well. So in the state of California, there are 32 LEMSAs, and LEMSA is a local EMS agency. And the, as you know, there's over 50 counties in the state of California, so some of these LEMSAs have crossed jurisdictional boundaries, and they govern pre-hospital emergency care in the various counties. Of the 32 in the state of California, 28 of them offer alternative staffing models as, a, as something that can be done. There are four counties that, that mandate there must be two firefighter paramedics or two paramedics on an ambulance going to the scene of a call. They are Los Angeles County, Orange County, Contra Costa County, and Santa Cruz. They do not offer any sort of alternatives. Staffing alternatives have not proven in those 28 local EMS agencies, there is no data that has ever been written, either in the state of California or nationally, that suggests that staffing an ambulance differently than staffing the way we do in Los Angeles County, for instance, provides a degradation of patient care. It just doesn't. There is no data that suggests that anywhere that we could find. We looked across this country to try and find examples that we could basically shoot you know, h holes in our hypothesis, and we were unable to find any data anywhere in the country that suggests that two paramedics riding to the scene together provides better patient care. 
Um, the current system that we utilize at the Long Beach Fire Department. In, in Long Beach, we currently deploy 16 fire engines. Um, on those six, of those 16 fire engines, nine of them are considered paramedic assessment engines. So one of the two firefighters, let me back up, all of our fire engines and trucks in the city of Long Beach are staffed with four people. So on nine of those fire engines in the city of Long Beach, one of those people, one of the firefighters in the back seat is a firefighter paramedic, and that qual qualifies them as a paramedic assessment unit. We also deploy eight ALS rescue ambulances, paramedic rescue ambulances, you've seen these before. It, they have two firefighter paramedics on board. They're, they're fully sworn, they're firefighters first that have a, they've gone to paramedic school and they have the skill of being a paramedic. We also deploy five basic life support ambulances in the city of Long Beach, three of which are on a 24 hour shift rotation like a fire, fire department uh, employee would be, and two of them are peak load staff, 12 hours. So they come in during the nine to nine and handle those peak load uh, calls for us. Um, in 2012, the average response time in Long Beach for a first arriving unit on a medical call is six minutes and 11 seconds for the first arriving engine or truck. And that, that's for any engine or truck. So maybe with a paramedic, maybe without, because as I mentioned, we only have nine engines with a paramedic on it. So six minutes and 11, uh, excuse me, six minutes and 58 seconds. In 2012, the first arriving, um, that's for a paramedic to get on scene, six minutes and 58 seconds. The first arriving unit without a paramedic on scene citywide was six minutes and 11 seconds. So taking, taking that into consideration, we moved on to the, what we coined the rapid medic deployment model. What the rapid medic deployment model does is it would change the number of paramedic rescue, cap rescue ambulances we have from eight, we would move it up to 11. We'd have 11 of them in the city now. We would eliminate the basic life support ambulances that I spoke of earlier. The, each one of the paramedic ambulances would be staffed with one firefighter paramedic and one EMT ambulance operator. As I mentioned, we run this basic life support ambulance program. They're EMTs, they're non-sworn, they possess the same EMT certification that our firefighters possess, but they're non-sworn, non-suppression personnel. So the thought was, let's take the second paramedic off the rescue ambulance and redeploy that person to the fire engine. Because most of the time in our city, and I think this is probably the case in a lot of places, most of the time that first arriving unit is an engine or truck. This is the first, there, there's, we have more of them because we've deployed based on a fire model versus an EMS model. So most of the time that first arriving engine or truck will show up first. So the thought was if we take the paramedic, one paramedic off the rescue ambulance and put a paramedic on every single engine in the city, we'll decrease the amount of time it'll take to get a paramedic on scene by about 40 seconds citywide based on 2012 data. The second thing we do is we staff the ambulances with that one basic life support ambulance operator and one firefighter paramedic. The, the, what this does for us is a couple things. Number one, it reduces personnel costs because I'm going from a sworn top step firefighter with a 16% skill pay to be a paramedic to a non-sworn EMT ambulance operator that's not getting a safety series retirement and I'm not gonna have to pay the overtime. Now keep in mind in Long Beach at the time we were discussing this and to this day, we have, we're carrying about 25 vacancies in our firefighter rank. So each and every day, those firefighter vacancies are being filled on, under the constant manning clause in the contract with overtime. So by shifting these firefighter paramedics back onto the engines, I eliminate at least five shifts per day in the city that are being carried a time and a half in my budget. Ultimately, I save, um, I save about just under $2 million a year by making this move. Now, I will tell you, one of, the, one of the questions that always comes up is, isn't it better to have two paramedics treat a patient? Yes, we would agree with that. Right from the outset, we agreed with the notion that was put forward by the County Board of Supervisors in 1968 that having two paramedics on the scene is better for patient care. Our point is, it doesn't make a bit of difference how they get there. If they get there on an engine and the second one gets there on the paramedic rescue ambulance, the full scope of practice can still be employed and the, the patient doesn't, doesn't really matter. And as was mentioned in the, pre, in the previous presentation, time in EMS saves lives. So the faster I can put a paramedic on scene, the better chance for outcome. The faster I can put somebody with that higher level of medical care, uh, medical qualifications on scene, the better the potential outcome. So the department um, approached this from that standpoint and we thought this, this is something that we should actually look at doing because uh, we looked up and down the state, as I said, it's being done all over the place. Now, one, one key component is of the ALS level calls, in 2011 in Long Beach, we had 
14,000 roughly ALS or advanced life support level transports to the hospital. ALS is somebody having chest pain, maybe a seizure, shortness of breath, those sort of things. Something that would need a paramedic. 14,000 times we transported somebody to the hospital. 99, just above 97% of the time on an ALS level call in Long Beach, one firefighter paramedic drives the ambulance to the hospital and the other firefighter paramedic rides in the back of the ambulance and renders aid to that patient. Just under 98% of the time. So at the core of the question was also, can't we cut down our costs? It seemed the logical place to look. This is the biggest piece of what we do. The logical place to look was in that transport piece. Do I really need to have a top step sworn safety employee driving the ambulance to the hospital? Or could I redeploy that person to another apparatus and have a lower cost employee drive the ambulance to the hospital? So there's a lot of things that we're still working out on that, but that, that was the core of the question for us. The, Obviously, the, the, there's, there's a lot of questions. There's questions not only from the EMS agency, there's questions from the labor groups, there's questions from a number of um, our council members and our city staff on whether or not this would constitute a degradation of patient care, whether or not this would constitute a degradation of the number of firefighters available for firefighting or fire suppression activities, and all of those, those things we are currently working through. But I am confident, based on all of the data, because we're approaching this from a data-driven standpoint, that at the end of the day, we'll be we will embark on this pilot study and we will prove it to be an effective uh, allocation of our resources and a redistribution of those skills. So with that, I thank you for your time and I'll turn it over to the next person. Great, thank you, Chief, appreciate that. Let's not forget on, on your tabletops there should be some white index cards. So if you have a question as uh, the different speakers are, are coming up, go ahead and fill those out and towards the end we'll grab those and we'll answer as many of them as, as we can. Uh, our next speaker I need to apologize for. Deputy Chief, I thought you were going to be second and uh, given that you're from Orange County's largest bedroom community, we should have treated you with more respect. <laughs> But please, uh, won't you welcome the Deputy Chief from Los Angeles County, and he oversees 170 fire stations as uh, the executive management uh, level in multiple cities throughout Southern California. So you're getting a flair. You've got a, a, a mid-sized city. You've got another larger city. Now we're going to talk a little bit from the county perspective. So please uh, welcome the Deputy Chief. Well, I too brought my wife, Teresa, and uh, we recently, this past this Friday, celebrated our 38th anniversary. And if you uh, had the honor to meet her, you'd quickly realize that number one, I definitely married up. And secondly, I definitely married a minor, uh, with the permission of her parents, by the way. So, um, I'm gonna speak about a topic that uh, obviously I am very passionate about. I believe that there is a critical decision point in America's fire service, very similar to the decision point that we faced in the 1970s. Do we embrace EMS, or do we continue to just put the wet stuff on the red stuff? For those fire departments that chose to embrace EMS in the 1970s, they're still around. For those fire departments that just chose to fight fires, many of them aren't around anymore. We're at a very similar decision point right now as to what we do with the next generation of all-risk fire department service delivery models. I believe we're facing, one, a new paradigm, two, a new risk profile, three, new opportunities, and four, significant, significant additional revenues for what we do and what we will do in the future. I want to tell, what I want to do right now is I want to set the stage for the kind of environment that we're living in right now. And to my private ambulance partners, you guys got it right. Bill, when ACA, Affordable Care Act, was written four and a half years ago, private ambulance companies paid attention to it. They studied every word and they understood the emerging business opportunities of the ACA. That was before God bless us, the fire departments across America could even spell ACA. <laughs> there are some tremendous opportunities in the ACA, and I want to talk about that. But what I want to do, I want to try to get, set the stage for what's going on right now. AMR makes a bid for major fire departments across the nation. Cincinnati, Los Angeles City, Dallas. You've got to ask yourself a question, why are they doing this? It's not because they're bad guys, they're great folks. AMR is a very excellent ambulance organization. 
This is a very good bid that AMR gave the City of Dallas Fire Department to take over their fire-based EMS operations, specifically their transport arm. Can't read that, but this is Wackenha, traditionally a security firm that made a bid to take over both fire protection and EMS from the City of San Carlos, Northern California. Why'd they do that? EMS Structure for Quality, first published in 1994 by the American Ambulance Association, revolutionized private ambulance companies and turned them into an incredibly professional organization. They see the opportunities in the Affordable Care Act. They realize that, in fact, AMR just created a, a third business entity called Innovations. One of the reasons Kurt Williams set that up is to specifically take advantage of the opportunities in the ACA. Does this matter? A private equity firm recently bought out Rural Metro Ambulance Company for $1.5 billion. Let me ask you a question. What do private equity firms do? They make money, sure. They're not mission specific. They look for opportunities to buy companies that they see a potential profit in. So again, folks scratch your head and say, mm, what's going on? Does this matter? A private equity firm buys AMR, the largest ambulance provider in the United States, for $3.5 billion. Why'd they do that? Falk, who traditionally has been, a, well, they started in Denmark. They are the, what someone would call them as the Halliburton of private fire protection and EMS in Europe, provide privatized fire protection and EMS in Denmark, Germany, Spain, and a, a good chunk of Europe, is now in the United States and in some estimates almost overnight became the fifth largest provider of ambulance services in the United States of America. What do they see that we don't, folks? Obviously, these private equity firms see something that we don't. And it's got to be money because that's what they do. So let's talk about that. A good friend of mine who is a deputy fire chief for, um, for Ontario Fire Department, he says, Mike, when you're scratching your head about what's going on in EMS, follow the money. So when you establish an EMS delivery system, there's three pillars you have to address. The dispatch side, the first response side, and the transport side. And let's talk about where the money is in some of this stuff. In dispatching, thank, uh, in part because of the Warren Act passed many years ago, which established a 911 system, provides revenue for the dispatch component of public safety. So there's some money involved in the dispatching, the first pillar of public safety services. The second, the first response piece. Alan did a great job articulating, and so did Chief Dury, that there is a very, very important first response component on certain kinds of runs. For heart attacks, for fires, for those significant runs, a short first response component saves lives and protects property. But it is very, very expensive. The shorter the response time, the more expensive your system becomes. And currently, currently, there's no money to support the first response piece short of the property tax or the tax base of the city that supports it. And then clearly the third pillar of, of EMS provision is the transport piece. It's a decent money maker. You get to bill for services. Currently, most departments most ambulance companies will get revenue anywhere from 48% to 65% on the dollar. Depends on your demographics. It's not a huge money maker. Typically, when you sell a product for a dollar, you expect to get a dollar back. That's not the case when it comes to the transport component of what we do. Why do we only get 48 cents on the dollar or 60 cents on the dollar? Why? Uninsured? Underinsured? Capitated payments? Medi-Cal? pays $120 for an ambulance transport versus the $1,000 or $1,200 bill that most ambulance companies charge for a Medi-Cal patient. It's not a big money maker, so scratch your head. What is going on? What is happening? Let me tell you what's happening. To a great degree, it is the Affordable Care Act, which, as a national goal, is going to provide health insurance for 95% of Americans. 
And so now, with the significant integer population that many of us experience, there's going to be a way to collect additional revenue because those people are now going to have insurance. So that is why private equity firms are buying rural metro and AMR. That is to a significant degree why Falk is here. That is why opportunities are opening up for companies like Wack and Hud and a number of others to get into the first response on the EMS market because there's more money around the corner for ACA. National health care. Again, 95% of all Americans are going to have health insurance of some way, shape, or form. Ambulance collections are going to increase, most certainly. The private equity firm saw this long before we did. So, the thing is, is we have to change what we do. Currently, back in the 1970s, Los Angeles County Fire Department, out of our EMS calls, would respond, out of all the calls we respond to, about 70% of our patients required paramedic intervention. Today, in some of my more challenged geographic divisions, only 35% require paramedic intervention. The remainder of those patients require what? Access to medical care of some way, shape, or form. Now, let me tell you, Mrs. Jones, let's say Mrs. Jones, who is a Medicare patient, she calls 911 because we've taught people to call 911 for the past 40 years. She calls 911. And what do we do? She has a hurt foot. Her ankle hurts. It's been hurting for a while. She calls 911. What do we do? We send out an engine company because we have a first response component. We send out an ambulance. We stick her in the back of an ambulance, which is, by the way, the second most expensive form of transportation known to man, second only the space shuttle. <laughs> we send her to the emergency room, which is the most expensive component of health care for her foot. And so the question that we as America's Fire Service have to ask, does she need a five minute response time? No. Does she need to be put in the back of an ambulance, a code three ambulance and taken to the hospital? No. Does she need to go to an emergency room? No, she doesn't. What if we innovated the system? What if we changed the paradigm for what we do? And America's Fire Service began to think of alternative transport models to take Mrs. Jones to a clinic I was at a summit where we're talking about community paramedicine. And a, uh, an executive from HealthNet said, Chief Metro, it, what you're saying is if you develop an alternative transport mechanism, whatever it is, and take one of my patients to a healthcare clinic instead of a emergency room, you're thinking about doing this. It's just ma'am, I am. And a doctor from across the room in this meeting says, yeah, but Medi-Cal and Medicare will never pay for it. And she turned to me and she stared at me in the eyes and she says, I don't care because I'll share my savings with you. A $4,500 bill for Mrs. Jones could be quickly transformed to a $450 bill. ACA is going to demand that we do things like that because somewhere around 2016, we as a medical community and America's Fire Service are going to have to prove the financial efficacy of what we do. And continue to put Mrs. Smith in the back of an ambulance and take her to the emergency room is going to be proven to be an inefficient use of health care dollars. So we're going to have to innovate. We're going to have to do something different. And we're going to have to do things that are for the patient instead of doing things to the patient. Now, if you think about that for a second, that's really profound. So we already talked about this. AMR is making some significant efforts to innovate their system. Again, I said they set up a third business entity called Innovations. They just released a paper the other day advertising their ability to provide community paramedics to patients like Mrs. Jones. They see an opportunity to provide care, better care, more efficient care, I should say. And they see an opportunity to make some money in so doing. So, as we look, what's happened is our risk profile has changed around us. It has changed dramatically around us, and now people are calling 911 because they want access to medical care. But yet again, a, a most, uh, across America's fire service, we have not adjusted to that change in our risk environment. And so what we need to rethink, at least on the EMS side, is we need to figure out a way to send the right person with the right training and the right equipment in the right vehicle in the right time. This is how we need to re-engineer our systems. Because ladies and gentlemen, 
There is a business opportunity that is developing, and there's a vacuum that is so profound that I hear the sucking sound right now. And either we will design our future, or we'll become victims of it. And there's an opportunity that we, as America's Fire Service, serving our cities and our counties, can make a significant amount of money if we redesign our system to adapt to the ACA. So, there's lots of ideas out there. For instance, San Antonio split apart their trucks and put a captain and a paramedic on a rapid attack vehicle and left the engineer and the firefighter on the truck. And so they take care of some of the less serious responses. Twelton Valley has a CARS program where one paramedic is on a special vehicle that takes care of the lesser types of runs. San Diego Fire has a program where they identify frequent flyers and they send a San Diego, actually it's one of their ambulance companies, uh, send them out there and they, and they plug them into the right social network so they stop calling 911 to solve their problems for them. Community paramedicine, oh I wish I had time to talk about this because this is going to redefine what we can do for Mrs. Jones. Mobile health care, alternative transport vehicles, alternative destinations, contracted clinics, home visits, the 3 and 30 solution. Let me give you a scenario here. Let's say that a person who calls 911 calls our dispatch center. And if it's a fire, if it's a heart attack, if it's a traffic collision, we send the militia, we send big red, we send middle sized red, we send little red, we send the cops if they have nothing else to do. <laughs> Sorry, is any, any law enforcement officers here that are most importantly armed? <laughs> we'll continue to do that. But let's say Mrs. Smith calls our, again, our 911 dispatch center, and we have a nurse practitioner who is taking these calls, who will get to send the right person, the right training, the right vehicle, and the right time to take care of Mrs. Smith. And let's say we, take, we tell Mrs. Smith, Mrs. Smith, it's 8.30, oh, no, no, I'm sorry, 7.30 right now, and in an hour and a half, we're going to send an alternative transport vehicle to pick you up and take you to one of our contracted clinics. Wait a minute, I'm not used to that. I'm used to all you folks coming out. Yeah, but you know what, Mrs. Smith? Last time we took you, you spent six hours in the, in the waiting room waiting for to get your foot fixed. Oh, yeah, I didn't like that either. Yeah, I'll, I'll be just fine with you sending me to a clinic. Again, $450, $400, $300 versus $4,500. This is a business opportunity, folks. Let's say somebody calls little Johnny has an asthma attack. What are we going to do for little Johnny? Give him a breathing treatment, take the emergency room, they'll wait, they'll monitor his PO2, they'll give another breathing treatment, send him home after six hours, Johnny's very unhappy. Let's say we had a mobile health care van staffed by a community paramedic or a nurse practitioner who goes to little Johnny's house, who gives little Johnny a breathing treatment, who leaves a telemedicine sensor on little Johnny to monitor his PO2. Let's say we did that. And let's say we charge $400 for that service. You get the opportunity. There's business opportunities, folks, that are opening up here. These are huge. The 3 and 30 problem, hospitals. Anybody here from the hospital industry? ACA, ACA, you know there's a 3 and 30 rule. If you get readmitted to the hospital after 30 days of your discharge for the same problem, certain chief complaints, the hospital not only won't get paid, but the hospital is going to get penalized. The hospitals are worried about this because most of the time the reason people get readmitted because they don't take their medication, they don't follow their diet, they don't do the right things. Let's say that our re-engineered systems take care of the hospital's problem. And we go visit their discharges. We go make sure that they're, ta they're taking their medication. We make sure they're on the right diet. We make sure that their congestive heart failure isn't coming back again. We can charge the hospitals for that. And we can open up another business opportunity. There's huge opportunities for us if we understand what's coming. GEMT, in October of 2011, AB 673 was passed. This opportunity opened up for public safety agencies, governmental agencies, to charge the federal government for something called CPE, Certified Public Expenditures. For those of you that bill Medi-Cal for your service, currently, if you're a hospital, in LA County Department of Health is one of the biggest recipients of CPEs, if a Medi-Cal patient goes to the hospital and it costs $5,000 to provide that service, Medi-Cal only pays a small percentage of that. Let's say they pay $1,000. That's a $4,000 loss at hospital fields. The hospitals currently, through the CPE program, can bill half of that. AB 678 allow the fire service to begin to do that. 
And so now, if a $1,200 or $1,500 ambulance ride, it's a Medi-Cal patient, and they pay 120 bucks, we can bill CPEs for 50% of that margin. You get to see the kind of revenue opportunities that are opening up for us. Imagine, GMT is huge for us. The hospitals have been using this for years. Now America's Fire Service or public safety entities in California can do it right now because of AB 678. And this project is being worked through CMS or Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services right now to determine some of the pay rates that we'll get to, get to enjoy. The Sacramento County Fire Department bills third-party insurance companies for a first response fee. Yeah. And they pay, they completely pay for their EMS service delivery. There's no loss that they experience because they bill third-party insurance companies for first response fees, they bill appropriate amounts for ambulance transports, and they're going to be taking advantage of the GMT. These folks are business opportunities that we can fade, we can, we can challenge, we can latch on to if we redesign our systems. And I tell you what, in 2016, if we continue to put Mrs. Smith in the back of a very expensive ambulance and send her to the emergency room, someone is going to come along with a better mousetrap, and we will become victims of that better idea. So there is huge revenue opportunities if we as cities, counties, fire protection districts, and fire departments take advantage of them. So, Wayne Gretzky had a great quote. I don't skate to where the puck is. I skate to where the puck is going. And I think what a great example that is as we look at the opportunities of the Affordable Care Act. Folks, don't skate to where the puck is because we'll find ourselves lacking in a couple of years. Skate to where the puck is going to be. And I tell you what, the ACA is going to demand that we become more efficient in our service delivery. ACA will demand that. ACA will demand that we reinvent our systems. And so now it's going to be up to us as to whether we have the innovation and the courage to do just that. Do we have the courage to reinvent our systems? Does that mean we dump our first response and our five-minute response? No. But does it mean we find a different way to help Mrs. Smith? Yes, it does. And if we don't do it as a fire service, if we don't do it as a city, if we don't do it as a county fire protection district, whatever your model is, it's going to be done because this is business. Why did rural metro get bought out? Why did AMR get bought out? Why is Falk here? Folks, this is business. There's opportunities there. And we've got to redefine our systems in order to figure this out. So, new revenue. There's lots of new revenue out there. Added value fee-for-service options, 69 or 59 fire departments in California have implemented various fee-for-service options. There's companies out there that bill for these for us on our behalf. Medi-Cal coverage for indigents and the poor. Some of you may be saying, yeah, but the demographics of my city, we may not be able to take advantage of the GMT because you don't have a high Medi-Cal population. But well, let me tell you what, the Aberyst Group has just estimated that 40% of Californians in the next several years, their primary medical care coverage is going to be Medi-Cal. If you continue to only rely upon $120 for, for a medical transport and your Medi-Cal population rises to 40% of your demographics, you're going to be in trouble. You're going to be in trouble. The ground emergency medical transport fee component. Folks, this is huge. This is huge. Pass-through programs. There is tremendous opportunity for additional revenue if we redesign our systems. But we're going to have to. So, shall I say, and on I believe this, the planets are truly lining up. Sometimes the management of change is not about how smart you are, but it's how you take advantage of opportunities. And there is a lot of opportunities that are coming our way if we understand the business aspect of what we do. That's going to be critical. So uh, I'm sure questions will come in a minute, but uh, thank you very much. Oh, was that not good information? I'm, I'm watching heads and I'm seeing people just starting to think about things that maybe you've not thought about uh, before. We're getting a very good uh, perspective. And the one thing that I took away from there is when the chief deputy said, you know, going in the back of an ambulance is the second most expensive way to travel 
versus the space shuttle, I always thought it was on the California high-speed rail. <laughs> Something good to learn. <laughs> Do not tell my boss that. <laughs> You know, we've, we've gone from two local cities to a county, and now we're going to, to hear from the former state fire marshal of California. You'll find uh, his bio uh, in your program as well. But please join me in welcoming Ronnie Coleman. Well, thank you very much. Please don't uh, read that bio. It sounds like my obituary. I'm the oldest guy up here. And uh, I've been around for a long time, so I want to talk really, really fast to cover a couple of really, key, really key points and perhaps take a totally different perspective. And you know, you guys all told stories about your wife and all this other stuff. I want to tell one about myself. I was started my fire service career in this town. Uh, I was a Coast Mesa firefighter in like in 1960. Anybody in this room remember uh, Mayor Pinkley? One guy. I'm glad to hear somebody still remembers him. But at any rate, uh, I'm sort of here as a, uh, what do they call it, cleanup batter of, of some things, and I'm going to have a really short speech and say, turn to these guys and say, I agree. <laughs> Everything they said, I... You were awesome, man. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't promise I was going to do that. I just said I could think about it. I'm going to take a slightly different perspective. Could someone change my slides to put my program on there real quick? Should be the next one. Out of the box thinking. How many of you people in this room have heard the term out of the box thinking? How many of you heard of it? Okay, how many of you do it? Yeah. Oh, good, because you, I'm not really so much interested tonight in what we're talking about in terms of specifics as much as I'm interested in asking you an overhead question. What are you going to do about all this information after this meeting is over? What are you going to do to apply it? What are you going to do to make, to make a change? What are you going to do to make a difference? Because what we're talking about here, and we've got some good news and some bad news. The bad news is all the easy stuff has been done. OK? That's the bad news. OK, now what is the good news? The good news is that we control more of our future than we had to do of our past. The past is over with and done and all this other stuff. And quite frankly, I'm sort of an amateur uh, historian and I've heard a, a couple of phrases used about my profession. And I recognize some people in this room that I've known for years. How many of you ever heard the term, the American Fire Service is 300 years unhampered by progress? <laughs> okay, it's poppycock. We are not only 300 years of tradition, which, which, by the way, tradition is nothing more than we keep on doing it because we forgot why we did it in the first place, <laughs> is the fact that we have changed more in the last 50 years than any other single profession in our business has. Cops are still shooting people. Firefighters are now doing totally different things than they did 50 years ago. What are you going to do to cope with change based upon the reality that change is being forced upon us today? There is no such thing as an easy road to the future. Now, uh, I'm a kind of a, I'm a false uh, prophet in a way. People call me a star, state fire marshal, but I'm actually a training officer. I spent most of my entire career uh, conducting training programs, so I'm used to using PowerPoints, and I've only got 462 more to go through before my presentation's <laughs> over tonight. <laughs> nah, not really. I wasn't gonna, what are you going to do to cope with change? Now, you just heard this man say that self-assessment and standards of cover is a methodology. Would you watch a football game if they didn't keep score? Would you watch a baseball game if they didn't keep score? Well, you see, what he's talking about is keeping score. It's called self-assessment. It's called accreditation. It's called demand data. Now, I'm going to look at my fire service guys in the room here and say, guys, we've got to do everything we possibly can to start putting science back into what we do and stop talking about generalities. And I'll look at the politicians in this room and say, you start demanding data. You need to have specifics, not generalities. Now, the kind of concept I'm talking about here, we could talk for the next five hours, and, and, and uh, uh, you still probably wouldn't see the entire spectrum. So here's my one thing about you thinking outside the box. Start talking about measurement. Start talking about scope. Start talking about the, the realities out there rather than deal with generalities. Out-of-the-box thinking requires out-of-the-box action. 
It means you've got to do something about that. See, self-assessment, excuse me, self-assessment is not an exercise for the fire chief. Self-assessment is an exercise for the community. Standards of cover is not an exercise for the fire chief. It's an exercise for the, uh, the citizens in a community. It's designed to be able to elaborate and, and, and clarify exactly what you're asking your department to do. There's only one thing sure in today's business world. You know where I took that quote? From the back page of Newsweek magazine. And nothing can be taken for granted. That's the bottom line here. Nothing can be taken for granted. Anything that we used to do because we didn't remember why we did it is going to be challenged. Anything we, we want to do because we now want to do it a different way is going to be challenged. Nothing can be taken for granted. We have to be put in a position of advocates, uh, being advocates and simultaneously evaluators. Now, I'm going to give you a, a, a concept here that's so simple it's like falling off a log, and that is that there's no such thing as a finished education in the fire community anymore. Graduating from Rookie Academy used to be the peak of a lot of people's careers. We are demanding today that everybody continue to change, become something different than they were uh, before. Now, I'm going to show you something here in a minute. And I'm gonna, it's gonna, uh, those of you in the fire service are going to immediately recognize it, but I'm going to tell you it revolutionized the American fire service. It totally devastated the way things that used to be done. As a matter of fact, when it was first brought out, firefighters by the hundreds quit their job because of it. They left the fire service. You have any idea what I'm talking about? That. <laughs> you want to read the plate on it? By the way, Dave Hubert's got one of these here in Orange County. You want to read the plate on it? You know what it says? This pumper will provide 1,250 GPM at 150 PSI at a 10-foot draft. That ring a bell to any of you guys? That's the same plaque on a modern engine company. 1,250 GPM. Now here's what I'm trying to say. Any of you guys want to have this rolling down your street? Personally, I love doing it. I've been in that rig a couple of times at a full gallop, and I'll guarantee you, if you've ever ridden in a front seat of a fire pumper at a full gallop when the fire is in the, the steam boiler, it gets your heart pumping. <laughs> it will. Here's my point. We can't stop change. Technology is evolving. It's evolving around us at such a rapid rate that those of us who are standing there watching it aren't paying attention to what's going on uh, in society. Now, I'm showing you two pictures there, and does anybody recognize either one of those fire, fire tools? Chances are you don't. You know what the one on the left is? It's a fire inspector's vehicle in Munich, Germany. You see what the one on the right is? It's a jet engine that's equipped to put out 1,500 gallons a minute through a jet engine that creates a water ball that's the size of this room. You know where that stuff is? Germany. It's in Germany. And I'm going to tell you right now that it's going to be here in a couple more years. How do I know that? This is my 52nd year in the business. I've watched all this stuff change and go, come and go. And I will tell you right now that innovation follows a path of necessity. Remember that steamer I showed you? When I said a whole bunch of people quit because they didn't want to learn how to use a steamer? When we put engines on the front of that steamer, more people quit because they didn't want to drive a truck as compared to driving horses. Resistance to change is futile. They stole that line for a science fiction movie, I said. <laughs> it's futile. You can't, because, I'll give you an example. What's going to be the next new best thing? Anybody have any idea what the heck that is? You might know? That's a truck company in Germany. It is. That's an auger that they have this truck, this auger that goes up, reaches across, and drops down, and puts a hole right through the top of a building and discharges water through the same hole. And I'm going to tell you point blank, and I'm not the least bit kidding when I tell you this story, that scares some people half to death. It really does, because it means that we don't have to send somebody up there on that roof to do that job. And we're also not going to have anybody fall through that roof when they're doing that job either. So here's my challenge to you as, as we're continuing to talk here. 
is we've got to think outside the box. We've got to start thinking about new tools, new technology, new techniques, new processes, new thought processes, et cetera. That happens to be a freeway motorcycle used in the German fire service. It's got a five gallon water tank on one side and it's got a, about a 1800 PSI cylinder on the other. When this guy pulls up in front of a car, you know, a motorcycle, he aims the motorcycle at the fire and pulls a trigger. <laughs> personally, I'd give my left arm to be able to do that just once, <laughs> personally. But here's my point, folks. Right now, what's really critical for the fire service, the public, elected officials, and so forth, is to start forming partnerships to evaluate the future. This is not about a specific anymore. It's about a philosophy of cooperation, coordination, and consistency. It's not us versus them. It's not the big departments versus the little departments. It's advancing the technology of the fire service. Try that on for size. What do you think that is? That's a blimp that carries about 50,000 gallons of water. Where is it? Nowhere. Nowhere. <laughs> yeah, he, he didn't believe me. You know why you haven't seen that? Because that is the design in NASA Ames. Scientists are fabricating solutions to many of our problems that we've got out here today, and we've got to become much more coordinated in terms of our acceptance of these ideas, our overcoming our resistance to change, and starting to look at things differently. That's the tradition of the American Fire Service. We have always evolved based on technology. I just left the Society of Fire Protection Engineers yesterday. I was with the Atlanta chapter of the Society of Fire Protection Engineers, and there were 600 people at that conference talking about changing America's fire problem. They're talking about the installation of, of new technologies. They're talking about the application of new technologies. And I'm going to tell you right now, as we said in this room, that we cannot stop the changes that are going to occur that are going to impact how we deliver fire services in this country. It's virtually impossible because engineering, and education and enforcement drive the development of new technologies that will sooner or later be adapted. This happens to be one of the, the props that they were using there yesterday showing a new fire extinguishing agent that actually is totally different than water. How many of you ever heard that water damage is a problem from sprinklers? Well, what happens if the chemical is not water? but evaporates instantly upon touching uh, uh, any other object. In fact, they took my telephone and, and put it inside the glass. I made the guy give me a deposit before I <laughs> tried that. But at any rate, things are happening. They're coming down here. Now, here's the real issue for you folks in this room tonight. We have challenges. Those challenges create adversity. And what we need to be doing is avoiding conflict in the resolution of those challenges. Everything, every idea I've heard from these gentlemen up here is doable, but it's not going to be doable without communications and coordination. There's going to have to be a great deal of interchange between what do I know versus what you know. The self-assessment process that was mentioned here a minute ago, I, I, I don't mind admitting this, I've been involved with that process for about 30 years, and yet I still find fire departments that don't have answers to basic questions of service level. There are many fire departments that have been getting by by saying the same old story that they've always said in the past because they've always been believed in the past. And what I think we need to do is to raise the bar on evaluation. Raise the bar. My granddad taught me something as a carpenter early on in my life. And that is you measure twice, but you only cut once. You need to measure what we're doing first. And then you need to measure it again. <laughs> before you make arbitrary decisions about the impact of why you're, why you're doing what you do. Now, I would love to say here I've got all the solutions for the fire department, but I don't. I, uh, some of you guys in this room might have remember my former mar fire marshal by the name of Gary Carmichael. Gary Carmichael and I went to a conference one day, and I was introduced as a, a, a model fire chief. And I get back in the car with Gary, and we're driving back down to San Clemente, and I said, yeah, that's kind of cool. Gary, what do you think about that? He said, big deal. I said, really? He said, yeah, big deal. He said, uh, 
you ever look up the word model chief? And I go, no, why? He says, it's a small representation of the real thing. <laughs> <laughs> put, me, put me right where I belonged. <laughs> so what I'm telling you is, remember that man on that apparatus right there from 1910. He was using a state-of-the-art technology to protect his community. That person is still in your firehouse. That community is still there. What we have to do is to start forming ways of communicating and articulating what changes are necessary to keep the fire service a modern fire service, not an antiquity, not an archive of an, uh, of an organization, but rather a viable, realistic organization that meets the needs of self-assessment, emergency medical services, hazardous materials, because there is no such thing as one size fits all. Contrary to popular opinion, there is not one size fit all fire departments in this country. Now, I'm gonna tell you point blank that what you got you here is not gonna get you there. Things have gotta change. How we've gotten to where we are today, I'm gonna to be real blunt and say that we've been here before. How many of you survived Prop 13? That same guy back there at New Pinkley. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, how would you have liked to have been a fireman in the Great Depression? We've been here before, folks. And we're going to be here again. The issue is, what are we going to do about it when it's our turn at the plate to cope with these changes? That's our job. That's our challenge. I appreciate the opportunity to have been here tonight and share a few thoughts with you. Thank you very much. Was that not a terrific panel that we had uh, tonight? You know, I just want to say, I, I hope you appreciated the conversation that we had tonight. We had elected officials, we have government uh, employees that maybe work in administration, but I keep seeing that these guys are looking over at these guys. So I think these guys are the ones that make this stuff happen. So we thank you for everything that you do for our communities, whether we live or work in your community. We might visit your community, and we know that uh, our health and, and welfare is your priority. So we thank you. <laughs> With that, Steve, do we have a couple of questions? You're going to know it's your question. <laughs> Okay, we'll see who's best to answer this. It says, with more EMS calls, does the current large engine design continue or change in the future? Let's put the guy from LA County on the spot. I can say unequivocally, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it truly does. It, tr it depends upon your risk model. You know, is a large fired engine still going to be appropriate for a structure fire? Absolutely, yes. Is it a more efficient opportunity for a first response EMS call than buying a second vehicle? Some would say yes. So it depends on your risk model and what you want to do with it. You know, what I can definitely say is, is a fire engine with a first response component of five minutes still the appropriate thing to do for Mrs. Smith, who has a hurt ankle who calls 911? Is it, is, it a, is it a five minute response time by an engine appropriate for her? The answer is no. The answer is no. You know, maybe you schedule that response for that fire engine for Mrs. Smith and you take care of her needs with a community paramedic that's on that fire engine in an hour from now. Maybe that model is appropriate, but it depends on what it is. It isn't a one size fits all. So that's my, uh, that's my answer for that. Great, and I'm gonna, the next question, I'm gonna read the questions that I can actually read, so I know some of these are from elected officials. But I believe this one says, municipalities have utilized quints, these guys, and ladder trucks with pumps and hoses, is using a quint fleet an effective way for the fire service? Alan? Sure. It is, and uh, there's a good reason for that. And I, I mentioned earlier that 
the fire department has an increased uh, responsibility and expectation from the community. And we've become all hazards. And I'll touch upon the previous question also. Uh, in Anaheim, we, we looked at increasing the roles and, and applying untraditional duties to certain firefighter personnel. Uh, a good example is we have a USAR and HAZMAT rig. Well, well those current uh, USAR and HAZMAT uh, personnel are cross-trained. They don't solely dedicate all of their time to just a USAR, nor do we have the call volume and demand for that type of service. They are on a first-line fire engine and respond to the day-to-day -day medical aids and all the other calls that come in, and then they cross-staff uh, a USAR and a HAZMAT rig, and that is an efficient way of doing business. So since we're an all-hazards department, I think the more capabilities that you put on any apparatus, the better off you are. Great, thank you. This next question was asked of two specific uh, panelists, and it was the two mics, saying auto aid agreements in the current economy are vital to providing service. How would Long Beach's, for example, EMS change or enhance or deter, or deter from current auto aid agreements? And why don't you, Mike, if you can, just a little bit explain what auto aid agreements are. Okay, what the question is referring to is automatic aid agreement in the, I guess, 70s? In the 1970s, um, many municipalities, actually up and down the state of California, entered into agreements with their neighboring municipality or city or county uh, to provide for automatic aid over those municipal boundaries. So if in Long Beach, say, in the north end of Long Beach, we just get busy and we don't have any apparatus to take the call on, we would rely on our partners in LA County we can dispatch them directly and they'll come in, and vice versa. If they get busy, they can call us and we'll respond in. And currently in Long Beach, we have automatic uh, aid agreements with Los Angeles City, Los Angeles County, and Orange County Fire Authority. So the, the, the question, I think, is, is geared toward uh, the, uh, asking whether or not what we're proposing in Long Beach would have an adverse impact on our ability to respond to automatic aid from Los Angeles County or another municipality? The answer is no, because we will respond. Part of our automatic aid agreement says they get what we have. If they call for service, we send what we've got. So we'll send, if we need to send um, an engine company and a rescue ambulance to make up a full EMS complement of people, that's what we'll do. But we have been in discussions with um, Chief Osby from Los Angeles County Fire Department, albeit briefly, um, talking about that automatic aid agreement, and I'm confident we'll be able to work through any issues that could come up, but it's not a deal killer. In automatic aid agreements, at LA County Fire Department, we cover 58 cities within the county of Los Angeles and one Orange County city. There are 33 fire departments within the county of Los Angeles, along with those that we border in Ventura and uh, Riverside County and, San, and um, San Bernardino County. In many of our areas, if it requires four engine companies for a structure fire, you may see three LA County engines and a Downey engine on that first alarm response. That's automatic aid. Basically, it's dropping boundaries. And it's a much more efficient method for the distribution of resources than attempting to do it all on your own within a jurisdiction. There are some, some areas in, our, in, in Los Angeles County jurisdiction that other neighboring jurisdictional engines are closer. We use them. And we have agreements, automatic aid agreements, that, that validates that. Let me, can I, let me just expand on that as well. So for instance, in, Los, in the city of Long Beach, as I mentioned, we run, all of our engine companies are staffed with four people. In Los Angeles County, in some places, just around the border of Long Beach, some of the municipalities that have contracted with the county have elected to go with a three-person staffed engine instead. If we call for the county to respond into our area, we don't dictate that you need to send us a four-person staffed engine. We just want them to send us what they've got. So it works in converse as well. And this will be the last uh, question for the panels. Will privatizing ALS transport personnel not affecting suppression paramedics help with fire units staying, quote, in service? And maybe I read it wrong. <laughs> Try it one more time. Will privatizing ALS transport personnel not affecting suppression paramedics help with fire units staying in service? I'm going to say no, and uh, we're going to move on. You know, thank, join, <laughs> join me again in thanking our panel.
Lacey and Lisa, thank you for letting me par participate this evening. And Lisa, we'll turn it back over to you. Well, thank you so much for joining us this evening for a very interesting and informative uh, panel discussion. I think we all gained a lot of great information, and uh, hopefully we can take that information and, and move forward in a positive fashion. So fill out your evaluation forms, and we look forward to seeing you at our next meeting. Thanks. Thank you.